I first flew the B-47 uh, in 1944. And my impression on getting into the cockpit was, well, if you get tired of flying this aircraft, I can go for a walk around the stick. It's, to me, and I'm, of, as you see, a fairly small stature, five feet seven, and um, it really was gigantic. Uh, it's a big airplane anyway, for a single seat fighter. It is a very large airplane. But um, my first impression was that do you really need this amount of airplane uh, to fight? Uh, I know it had a huge engine, but I've seen airplanes much more streamlined, with as much horsepower, and uh, altogether, my general impression was that something had ballooned in design unnecessarily. It was fast as a fighter, but when it got into Europe, it found its Achilles heel. That was the European war, unlike the Japanese war or the Far East war, was fought laterally up at about 30,000 feet. And the Jaguar P-47 could get up there all right, but it could not fight up there because it was so bulky, the wings were so thick. You had beautiful view from the canopy and everything. There, there were no criticisms that way. The cockpit layout, all right. A bit um, untidy, I would say, but generally acceptable. What was not acceptable was the fact that the aircraft performance in the um, transonic region oh. was very poor. Very poor indeed. Compared, for example, with the Spitfire, it was sadly lacking oh. in the speed performance. Across the seven seas, under the protection of armed escort, men and weapons of the United Nations move out to far-flung battlefronts, carrying the fight to the strongholds of the enemy. And the ships get through, busy docks near the scene of action. And case after case of American fighting planes, hard-hitting P-47 Thunderbolt. The job now is to hurl these Thunderbolts into action without delay. That requires the quick uncreating and assembly of the airplane under any conditions, anywhere. To make this possible, a simple practical method of uncreating and assembly has been devised, by which the P-47, although it weighs nearly seven tons, can be ready for battle without the aid of spatial equipment, such as heavy jacks, cranes, or hoists. To assemble a P-47 under field conditions, the only equipment needed is a standard set of mechanics tools, manpower, and the shipping cases themselves. The first step in the whole procedure is for the crew chief to read the instructions that are fastened to the front end of either of the shipping cases.
Important. Do not remove shipping cases from trucks until after you have read these instructions. The instructions are simple but important. Each step must be carefully followed. The instruction book should be read completely so that the crew chief may have an overall picture of the job to be done. Then he can go to work. First, the truck bearing the wing case is drawn up behind the fuselage case. This provides an elevated surface on which the men can stand while removing the fuselage case top. The fuselage case must remain on the truck. The top of the fuselage case is removed in one piece. Take out the lag screws. And pry up one end with a crowbar. This end is held up with a short piece of timber wedged into place. Two or three lag screws, which are inserted in each corner of the top, serve as towing posts, around which is looped the length of one-inch rope. Now, with manpower, the top is dragged off the case onto the ground. After the lag screws have been removed from one of the sides, this panel can simply fall to the ground and the other side is removed in the same way. Then, the ends of the case are taken off. We're going to need those stringers all through the job. They are pried loose from the sides of the case. They are sawed through the middle and the two halves are nailed firmly together. Now we are ready to unload the wing case and remove its contents. For this job, you need a pair of skids and the one-inch rope. Hey, go easy. That case weighs over three tons. When its top has been pulled off, the sides and ends of the wing case are removed by the same methods used on the fuselage case. After the hinge fittings in the wing case have been loosened, approximately 50 men, using the fuselage side stringer sections for lifting, carry the wings out of the case and place them on the ground. This wing is being turned over so that the landing gear is on the underside for convenience later on in assembly. After both wings have been taken out, the other parts in the wing case are removed. The parts from the wing case are laid out in orderly fashion and the crew chief is now ready to direct the construction of the platform on which the plane will be assembled. This platform is built entirely out of the material that makes up the two shipping cases. The first essential is a plot of firm, flat, and level ground. On this is placed one of the sides from the fuselage case with the flat side up. Eight feet from the front of the platform and on each side, a slot is cut for wheel clearance needed later in assembly. This slot is 30 inches long and 6 inches deep. Now the second side is brought up and laid over the first. A similar slot is cut in this second side. 
The finished platform looks like this. And here it is in diagram. Let's see how it's built. Here are the two fuselage case sides nailed together to form the base of the platform. Now comes the end of the fuselage case and the top of the wing case. Then comes the side from the wing case. And on the same level, a fuselage end. The remaining wing case side and the two ends from the wing case are laid on top and nailed in place. This leaves a space toward the back of the platform, which is built up by nailing together three two by fours taken from the wing case stringers and laying them lengthwise like this. The top of the fuselage case becomes the top layer of the platform. A diagram similar to this is reproduced in the instruction manual and should be followed in detail when the platform is being constructed. At this point, the crew chief is ready to direct the transfer of the fuselage onto the platform. If the level of the trailer bearing the fuselage is higher than the platform you have built, wheel pits of sufficient depth should be dug to bring trailer and platform to very nearly the same level. The truck bearing the fuselage is slowly and carefully backed up. Keeping it always in exact line with the platform. The prime mover is disconnected. The tow line is fastened around the entire bottom of the fuselage case. And by using the prime mover, the bottom of the case with the fuselage itself is eased squarely off the trailer and onto the assembly platform. Steady. Steady there. Just a bit more. Pull it right to the edge. Okay. Now, exactly at the back end of the shipping brace, the 10-inch section of floorboard is removed from the fuselage case bottom. Then a 10-inch section is cut out of the exposed 4x6 beams on each side. These cutaway sections, like the slot in the base of the platform, are important later in assembly. It is also necessary that the rear members of the shipping brace be removed. These members have been bolted and lightly welded in place. The bolts are removed and the weld is broken. That concludes the construction work. The crew chief can now begin to direct the actual airplane assembly. First, the engine cowling is taken off. This goes quickly if at least four men are assigned to the job. Now the engine must be clean. Kerosene or other suitable solvent may be used in removing the anti-corrosion compound sprayed over the engine before shipment. The carburetor and lower cylinders should be drained of any oil or moisture which may have accumulated. Also, the spark plugs and connecting harness must be installed. These procedures should be done in accordance with instructions found in technical order number 02-1-1. While this is being done, the protective tape and other coverings are taken off to expose all openings and fittings of the fuselage, wings, and all other parts. After complete inspection of the work that has been done on the engine, the cowling may be replaced. During shipment, steel braces have supported the weight of the airplane. The braces are connected to these wing hinge or pin connections. The weight must be released. 
and transferred to these steel resting pads. This is accomplished by turning up the jack screw just two or three turns. This is enough to relieve tension on the master bolt. Then the master bolt, which has actually carried the full weight of the plane, can easily be removed. The direction of the jack screw is then reversed. It is turned down until the weight settles on the steel resting pad. Now the hinge bracket may be removed. The hinge is then free and clear. and ready to receive the wing. To prepare for the wing assembly, we remove the pilot seat to provide more working space in the cockpit. Now, caution. Both aileron control rods must be inserted now, flush with the fuselage. It will be too late after the wing is on. The crew chief checks to be sure that all wing connection drift pins bushings, bolts, and tools are ready and on hand. When he's sure that everything is in its place, he can start to direct the actual wing assembly. It takes about 50 men to carry the wing of a thunderbolt. Easy does it. That baby weighs over 1,800 pounds. The trick here is to line it up straight. Take it slow, drop the wingtip just a little bit so that the bottom set of hinges can be lined up and connected first. After the lower set of hinges have been secured, the wingtip is lifted and the upper hinges are lined up. Both upper and lower wing and fuselage hinges are secured in the same manner. They are lined up with the aid of drift pins. When the hinges are in perfect alignment, the bushings are installed, always with the split side upward. A bushing inserter is used to drive the bushings through the hinges. The drift pin is forced out as the bushing is driven home. When all the bushings are in place, the men can ease off a few at a time so that the support they have been giving the wing will be released gradually. Next, the tapered bolts are inserted. The heads of these bolts should always be facing each other, pointing toward the inside of the wing. Tap and tighten, tap and tighten very carefully. Finally, the bolt is brought to correct tension with a two-finger pull on an eight-inch wrench until at least three threads are visible on the end of the bolt. Once both wings are on, we are ready to make all wing root connections, except for the cables and control rods. This requires a thorough understanding of the connections to be made and their location. Since these connections are in very tight quarters, let's look at an animated diagram. Here are the connections to be made at the left wing root. The fuselage is here, and the wing root here. Here are the connections which are found in both wings. 
the flap hydraulic lines, the cannon plug, the aileron control rod, the landing gear and brake hydraulic lines, the uplock cables, and the gun heater tube. Now let's see the connections found only at the left wing route. They are the aileron trim tab cables, the static and pitot airspeed lines, and the oxygen line. Here's the situation on the right wing. In addition to the connections you see here, which are common to both wings, we have the fuel vent and the cockpit air scoop. Remember, at this point, we make all connections except the control rod and cable connections, which should not be made until after the landing gear is down. In preparation for lowering the landing gear, a pit must be dug under each wing in line with the path that the wheels will take. This pit will have a maximum depth of about one foot at the point where the gear is fully extended. To lower the gear, wires which were attached to the uplock cables for shipping purposes are pulled at the wing root. The gear will now extend. Here is the reason we cut out that section of the platform. It would have obstructed the passage of the wheel. Notice, too, that the pits are dug quite close to the platform. In order to bring the gear down to the full downlock position, it is necessary for two men to get behind and push. When the downlock position is reached, an audible click is heard. With the necessary access holes now available, the uplock cables, the aileron control rod, and in the left wing, the aileron trim tab cables can be connected. Let's see what goes on inside that wing he's reaching into. To connect the uplock cables, the ends of the cables from the fuselage are drawn into the wing. The short cable from the fuselage is connected to the long cable in the wing through this access hole. The long cable from the fuselage is connected to the short cable in the wing through this hole. These connections are made with the turnbuckles, which are drawn up to a tension of 25 to 30 pounds. On the back side of this spar is a mycotic guide block, which we see here. The cables are threaded through this block. Now, the aileron control rod. There's an access hole in the cockpit floor here. By reaching down through this hole, we can secure the rod with this bolt, washer, and elastic stop nut. In the wing, the same procedure is followed by reaching up through the access hole and making the bolt, washer, and nut connection. Here we see a closer view of both connections. The fuselage connection and the wing connection. The trim tab cables remain to be connected. Here is the left wing. Here are the cables running out through the wing. By reaching down through this access hole in the top of the wing, connection is made by means of a turnbuckle. Tracer wires attached to the ends of the cables aid in pulling the cables to the points of connection. The long cable, pulled through by tracer wire, is connected to the chain by reaching up through this access hole. 
At this opening, reach in and install the pulley guard with a clevis pin and cotter pin provided. Here is a closer view of the pulley guard showing where the clevis pin is inserted. A safety wire which has been fastened around the chain is now removed and the cable tension is adjusted to 35 pounds. With our wing connections now complete, the next step is to make preparations for checking out the operation of the landing gear. First, we check the fluid in the hydraulic reservoir. Pressure is then built up in the hydraulic system by using the hand pump in the cockpit until the indicator shows 1,000 pounds. The flaps and brakes are now bled according to standard technical orders. 90 pounds pressure is pumped into the upper chambers of the shock struts, putting the gauge on the valve to the lower chambers. Next, after making certain that all the switches in the cockpit are in the off position, the battery, which should be brought up to full charge, is installed. Then the crew chief is ready to direct the actual testing of the landing gear, which should be raised and lowered at least three times. In the first retraction of the gear, the crew chief should check to see that the inner door and strut fairings fit smoothly in the wing. The next complete operation to be checked is that of the landing gear warning light. This light should remain on while the gear is being extended and should go out when and only when the gear has reached the full downlock position. The third testing of the gear is made for the purpose of checking the operation of the transfer valve. The rear inflation valve is removed the gauge is put on the front inflation valve, a pump is attached to the gauge, and 90 pounds pressure is pumped through the gauge into the lower chamber. The gear is retracted to the point where pressure is seen to drop in the gauge. That's enough. Then a bevel protractor is applied to the gear. If the gear is six degrees from vertical or within a minimum of five degrees to a maximum of 10 degrees, the transfer valve is operating correctly. We can get ready now to roll the plane off the platform. To do that, we must transfer the weight of the plane from the platform to the landing gear. First, the air must be released from the lower chambers of the shock strut. The landing gear must be fully compressed and held in this position while the pits are almost completely filled in. And the earth packed hard under the wheel. Now the man in the cockpit should park the brake. The entire plane is then jacked up by pumping air into the lower chambers of the shock strut. To make the pumping job easier and to relieve strain on the pump, several men rock the plane by pushing up on the wing. The result is that the plane is lifted above the steel rest pads of the shipping brake. Once the weight of the plane has been transferred to the landing gear, the two center skids behind the shipping case bracket are sawed through, and the front section of the fuselage platform with the supporting iron is pulled forward and clear. Now we are ready to release the tail from its shipping case brace. In preparation for this, air is pumped into the tailwheel strut until the piston is completely extended. The man in the cockpit locks the tailwheel to prevent it from turning sideways. We must build a track for the tailwheel to run on. To do this, we make use of one of the stringer sections formerly used to carry the wing. It is sawed into three equal lengths and laid directly under the tail wheel in the manner shown here.
The other stringer section is placed under the empanage jack pad. Eight men now lift the tail slightly to ease the tension on the tail shipping brace bolt. When the bolt is removed, the tail is slowly lowered until the wheel rests on the tail track. The stringer we just used to lift the tail can now be sawed through the middle and the two sections placed in front of the platform to form a tailwheel ramp. The tow lines are made ready and fastened to the towing hole. Stop, not there. That's the uplock hook. Use the hole that's marked for towing. A jeep is mighty handy in pulling the plane away from the platform, but manpower can do the job if necessary. The short sections of tail track are moved progressively as the tail wheel rolls forward. During this roll away operation, the man in the cockpit keeps a slight tension on the brakes to ensure slow, even movement of the plane. Here she comes, down the ramp, looking more like a P-47 every minute. Now is the time for pre-flight adjustment and inspection of the landing gear shock strut. First, all of the air is released from the lower chambers to allow the strut pistons to be fully bottomed. Next, we remove the plug on the lower chamber to see if it contains the proper amount of fluid. If there is sufficient fluid in the cylinder, it will be found level with the plug opening. Now the strut chambers are checked for proper pressures. 90 pounds is correct for the upper. And 360 pounds for the lower chambers. With these pressures, the clearance between the bottoms of the lower chambers and the ends of the pistons should be 1 and 5 eighths inches. To make certain that there has been no leakage in the transfer valve, the gauge is put on the upper chamber and checked again to see if it reads 90 pounds. We're moving right along now, and we're ready for installation of the tail feathers. The fin and horizontal stabilizer are treated as a sub-assembly which is installed by means of 10 bolts here and here, and four bolts in the rear bulkhead here and here. When this is done, the crew will be ready to string the control surface cables. There can be no confusion in stringing these cables because before shipping, each cable has been tagged to show where it goes. After the cables have been strung, the pulleys are put in place. The elevator tab cables are connected. And the cover plates are put on. The same procedure is followed for the rudder trim tab cables. Now the trim box in the cockpit should be set in neutral. The elevator control rod is placed in the tail and into position. The forward end is connected inside the fuselage. The elevator can now be installed. On each side, there are two stabilizer hinge fittings and one trim tab universal connection. The elevator control rod is connected to the elevator. The rudder is connected at the two pin hinges here and the rudder trim tab universal here.
The rudder cables are connected next. This can be done only after the man in the cockpit has put the control lock to on position in order to place the rudder in neutral. When all the cable, bonding, and rudder tail lights have been properly connected and inspected by the crew chief, the assembly of the tail feathers is complete. The ship is now ready for the installation of the propeller. Here are the steps in preparing for propeller installation. The plane is nosed up to within about two feet of the platform, so the men will have something to stand on while they work. Your very first action is to remove this brush holder assembly, because the brushes would be snapped off if the propeller were put on with the brush holder in place. Out comes the inner cone. And don't forget the shim, which is right behind it. The cone and shim must be thoroughly cleaned with a suitable solvent, and also the propeller shaft. The splines on the propeller shaft, and also the cone and shim, are then coated with a light oil. When this is done, the shim first, and then the cone are replaced making sure that the open portion of the cone is at the top. The propeller lock nut threads are coated with the prescribed mixture of castor oil and white lead. While the shaft is being made ready, the protective coating from the propeller itself can be removed. The splines on the inside of the propeller hub are cleaned and oiled, and the slip rings are wiped clean of any oil or dirt. When both the shaft and the propeller are ready for assembly, the propeller is brought up to the plane. You need at least 10 men for this job. Under the guidance of the crew chief, the propeller is carefully placed on the shaft. The number one blade should be on top so that the splines will be readily engaged. Now the main propeller shaft nut is tightened with the four foot propeller bar. After the nut has been drawn tight, insert the locking sleeve and secure with the lock pin assembly. Next, after cleaning, the brush assembly is put in place and the brushes checked for proper clearance on the slip rings using Prussian blue according to standard procedure. The propeller hub electric contact points are cleaned and made ready to receive the power unit. The power unit itself is removed from the case and cleaned with particular attention to cleaning around the contact points. Since the power unit is set in low pitch when packed, the blades on the propeller must be set in low pitch also. When the power unit is installed, the eight bolts are drawn up and secured with safety wire. The propeller gear housing is then greased and the speed reducing gear housing is oiled. With the power unit cover or spinner installed, the propeller assembly is complete. Now, all of the major connections on the airplane have been made. After a thorough inspection by the crew chief, we install the fillets and secondary cowling. The pilot seat is returned to its place in the cockpit. And when the pitot tube, antenna wires, radio mast, and pilot's rear view mirror have been installed, the armorers are ready to take over to install the guns and charge them. The job of assembly is done. The plane is towed off to the airfield runway. Here, after the plane has been fueled, the crew chief runs up the engine and makes one final check on the operation of all instruments and movable surfaces.
Ready to fly and ready to fight. This plane has been completely uncrated and assembled in the field. This simplified uncrating and assembly method is the answer to field requirements. Just as the plane itself, the P-47, answers the requirements of the fighting pilot. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was the largest and heaviest single-engine air fighter flown by any nation during the Second World War. At nearly 8,000 pounds, it was less agile than Spitfires and P-51s, and it didn't do well in low-altitude dogfights. But it could outdive any other fighter, and it could take an amazing amount of damage and continue to fly. And its 850 caliber machine guns gave it more lethal firepower than any other Allied fighter except the P-61 Black Widow. The P-47 could carry up to a thousand pounds in bombs and could mount rockets under its wings for use against targets on the ground. It was powered by the largest radial engine available, the same 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney that powered the F-4U Corsair and the F-6F Hellcat. Americans produced more than 15,000 P-47s, more than any other American fighter plane in any war. P-47s first arrived in Europe in late 1943, and once the bugs were out, it became the primary fighter bomber of the U.S. Army Air Forces. Its range was steadily increased until it could escort eight Air Force bombers all the way to Germany and back, and it could hold its own against any German fighter. Cruising in sweeps at very high altitude, P-47 pilots would attack at steep, high-speed dives and then use its momentum to climb back to altitude. Between D-Day and the end of the war, P-47s destroyed more than 7,000 enemy aircraft, more than half of them in air-to-air -air combat.
but the P-47's greatest role was ground attack. With its diving speed, massive firepower, and ability to absorb hits and keep flying, it was probably the best ground attack aircraft in the U.S. arsenal, destroying thousands of locomotives, railway cars, armored vehicles, and aircraft on the ground. In Europe, the P-47 earned fame from its success. In the Pacific, it isn't as well known. At first, pilots in the Pacific theater were not as enthusiastic about the big heavy airplane. They said it didn't have enough range for long over water flights, and it was too clumsy to compete with Japanese fighters in a dogfight. The first P-47s to reach the Pacific Theater were the newly created 348th Fighter Group deployed to Australia and New Guinea. One of the pilots in that group was Bill Dunham, a 22-year-old from Tacoma, Washington. He named his P-47 Bonnie after his fiance. Dunham would later command the 348th Fighter Group and would end the war as a high-scoring ace with 16 aerial victories. But Dunham's fame came not from his kills, but from an act of mercy. By December 1944, Dunham had reached the rank of Major, was commanding the newly created 460th Fighter Squadron, and was already a double ace with 10 aerial victories. On December 7th, the third anniversary of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Dunham Squadron was flying aerial cover for Allied landings on the Leyte in the Philippines. Dunham shot down four more Japanese fighter planes. One of the Japanese pilots bailed out. Dunham had heard the widespread story of Japanese fighter pilots shooting at defenseless Allied pilots in their parachutes, and he maneuvered to fire at the enemy pilot dangling in his parachute. But as the enemy pilot came into Dunham's gun sight, something happened to Dunham that he later described as God's hand on his shoulder. He did not fire, and the Japanese pilot floated down and landed in the sea. As a final act of chivalry, Dunham made a low pass and threw his May West life jacket to the floating enemy. Dunham would score two more aerial victories during the war, his last and 16th in a P-51 Mustang, which he named Mrs. Bonnie for his wife. After the war, Dunham commanded fighter units in the Army Air Corps, the U.S. Air Force, and the Strategic Air Command in the United States, Vietnam, and Europe. He retired in 1970 with the rank of Brigadier General and died in 1990 at the age of 70. In 2005, aviation artist David Hammond learned of Dunham's act of mercy toward a defeated enemy, and he immortalized the incident in a painting called Uncommon Chivalry that was unveiled in the presence of Dunham's widow, Bonnie. Let's go, team. Sir, you're, you're going to be sitting over there, sir. And the rest of you, okay, we'll go, uh, yeah. You're going to sit here, right? Yep, I'll sit there. Bruce, you're next. Yep. Okay. Margo and Shelly, you're next. Chuck, you're next. Bernie, I told you, you're going to be the end. I'll sit in there. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed McAlady. I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, presentation we've got this afternoon. And uh, just to let you know exactly what we're doing here, um, 
as I walk along, you're going to see the word history, heroes, and heritage. And that's what we're going to be talking about here this afternoon. We've got a beautiful airplane behind me. Um, we're going to talk a lot about the airplane, but more importantly, we're going to talk about uh, where it came from, its restoration, its acquisition, its performance, and uh, we, are, we are quite honored today to have this, this cast in front of me, um, and they include, and I'll, I'll start at the beginning, Bruce Ames, uh, the owner of the aircraft, and, and he's been here several times. Uh, he's brought, in fact, if you saw the program this morning on uh, Thunderbird, um, another one of his uh, tasks at hand, if you will. Um, Actually, that one's Warren Peaches. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, I understand, but but it was y your your part and parcel of it, okay. the Aircore Corporation, et cetera. Um, and yeah, Warren's out here somewhere, I'm sure. Um, but um, next, we've got two young ladies here who, uh, and if you take a look, you can see on the side of the airplane, it's called Bonnie, okay? Um, and, and Bonnie, as you saw from the video, uh, is, is named after Bill Dunham. Uh, and his w his wife and uh, and what we are honored to have here today are his two daughters. We've got Shelley and we've got Margot. And so those are the, the two daughters. Um, then we've got our, <coughs> our 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 local expert. We got Chuck Cravens, and he's going to be our our fact checker. Um, and uh, he has a, a a wealth of information about the airplane. Uh, and then we just got the pilot down there, and we got Bernie again. Uh, <laughs> Bernie Vasquez, uh, he's the guy who flew this thing in, probably going to fly it out also, I suspect. Um, got a lot of time in these things, uh, a uh, tremendously high-time Warbird pilot, and, uh, and I thank you, Bernie, for being here and, uh, and bringing us the airplane. He always gets to do the fun stuff. Yeah, he does. That's, I agree completely. Um, however, um, in our midst is also on the front row here, um, and I'll go with Aircore Corporation guys over here. We got Eric and Eric, and we'll be talking to them a little bit about the restoration of the airplane. But most importantly, I've got to bring up this uh, <coughs> this gentleman with a hat and the feather. Um, his name is Jerry Tilton, and uh, he had 66 missions in the European theater in P-47s. This man is one of the greatest generation. So. Jerry, thank you so much for being here. Take a look around. You got a standing ovation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I should say he's going to be the real fact checker because he did it for real. Yeah. And uh, and and we'll get to to his his stories later. But for right now, uh, I'm going to start with Bruce. And uh, Bruce is the guy who uh, brought the airplane to us. Um, he's the guy who sat there and said, hey, I want one of these. I like these airplanes. I want to restore one of these airplanes. And, uh, and he's the guy who made it happen. Everybody knows what it is, P-47D, uh, Razorback, as they call it. Uh, what? Chuck, help me now. They built over 16,000 of these. Is that right? Well, 16,000 P-47s of all models. Okay. Uh, so the, the D versions, there was um, something like 8,000, and about half of those were Razorbacks. Okay. And this is the last Razorback model, the D-23. Heaviest, heaviest single-engine fighter that we uh, used in World War II, um, and uh, we'll get more into details later. But for right now, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce and just say, okay, how did we get it? Where did it come from? Um, right. and, and, and why did we get it? Why? Well, uh, the why is just a, it's a long list of warbirds that I, I fantasized about ever since I was a kid. Like many of you, uh, I had a father that was in World War II, and all my buddies growing up, you know, they had dads that were in World War II, and so we built the models and, and uh, uh, dreamed about those planes. And um, with a lot of encouragement from Warren Peach of the Dakota Territory Air Museum, uh, he encouraged me to develop an interest in P-47 Thunderbirds. You want the real story? And um, I'm sorry? I didn't say <laughs> Oh, yeah. I said, you want the real story? Warren <laughs> made him do it. Yeah, he made me do it. <laughs> Thank but, you, Warren. Um, the, the, the thing that really attracted to me to it, besides very liking the plane, is that um, I like bringing the planes back. And um, uh, 
I think that the P-47 was a plane that, in, in terms of my experience, was not really recognized as much as it should have been. And there were so few of them left. Uh, very few of them really survived the, all the scrapping of planes after the end of the war and stuff, and especially the early models, the Razorbacks. And so when, when we decided to start looking for one, um, we heard of this one in, uh, that had been pulled out of Papua New Guinea. And um, this one actually was uh, found by a local um, who happened to be a, a Papua New Guinea Vietnam War vet, but that was living on a farm in Papua New Guinea. And he pulled this out of the bush and um, uh, ironically enough, uh, cut the turbocharger out of it and hooked it up to a tractor engine and used it to melt metal, nickel and copper for whatever he was doing and was going to take the rest of the plane out and um, uh, was stopped by a bunch of other locals that were armed with uh, machetes and, and guns who said, you can't do this. You can't take this out of here. And uh, a couple of days later, it showed up on its nose as a gate guard at the local airport. And that's where it sat for uh, quite a number of years until Rob Greinert out of uh, New South Wales in Australia uh, uh, acquired it in 1998 and bought it, brought it to uh, Australia. <coughs> and from there, uh, teaming up with Air Corps Aviation, we went over there and uh, had an epic trip and uh, visited the, the plane and uh, eventually packed it up in shipping containers in uh, 2010. I think it was the fall of 2010. In 2011, then it came over um, to Air Corps Aviation Shop up in Bemidji, Minnesota. Although I do remember that uh, if anyone's seen pictures of what this thing looked like when we... Uh, uh, brought it and packed it up. I uh, put my hand on Eric's shoulder when we were in Australia, and I said, "Are you sure we can build this plane back up out of this?" And so, a long <laughs> yes, eleven years, uh, twelve years later, here it is. And so, it's a great uh, uh, tribute to Air Corps Aviation and their skill and 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 commitment to bringing these planes back again. So, thanks to those Thank guys. Thank you, Air Corps. Thank yeah. you, Air Corps. So, that's how it came into our hands. And at that point, as we uh, started that process, the next thing was uh, uh, then turning to Air Corps Aviation's historian, their in-house historian, Chuck Cravens, to say, okay, what do we have here? Um, what, what group, what's the history of this plane? And, and who flew it? And et cetera, et cetera. And Chuck spent, geez, close to eight years uh, doing a lot of tedious, tedious research in, in identifying the plane, and he can talk about this a little bit more, but it finally came down to that uh, identifying what fighter group it had been in, and um, uh, we got to the point where, uh, through his research, uh, it uh, appeared that the plane had never been assigned to any one pilot, so that uh, uh, it seemed that it had been used in training and uh, and also as a, as an extra plane when other some other pilot's plane has been is off off the line for repair, and um, so then we started looking at who were the pilots that possibly had flown it in training in that group or had used it as a backup, and of course uh, Bill Nuttum's name comes up and it's 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 uh, uh, a story that just immediately resonated is this is a, definitely uh, an, exa an incredible example of, of the kind of men that fought for us in World War II and in particular that flew these planes and that he probably did standing fly this plane in, standing in that only. squadron. And so that's why we decided to um, uh, pursue the Bonnie livery and um, uh, finish it off in, in a, in a an accurate restoration of his plane. Um, and Chuck, you may have something to add to that. Yeah, you, Chuck, you got the story that you hadn't met these ladies uh, uh, ever well, and, well, and, and, and started to do some investigation and they provided you with information. I was connected, uh, or I got the you know, information from um, Terry Popravac, who wrote a really fine book about the 460th Squadron called Check Six. 
and uh, he gave me, he asked permission to give me Margot's contact information. And this was, I don't know, what, six years ago, something like that? Anyway, um, she was generous enough to send some guy in Bemidji, Minnesota she'd never heard of before his class book. And it wasn't just his class book. It was when they trained in Massachusetts to fly P-47s. He had, t he had written notes, his own handwriting, about every member of his squadron, what happened to him d during the war, how many aerial victories they had, including Neil Kirby, who's the number one Pacific P-47 ace. Yeah. Bill Durham was, Dunham is the second leading Pacific ace. Anyway, um, that's how we were connected. And the airplane, the biggest puzzle about it was it was abandoned on the eastern end of Papua New Guinea at a time when all the combat was on the western end, 1,500 miles away. So on September, I have information on May 8th, 1944, with a picture of the carrier it went across on at the dock at Townsville, then no information until it was pushed aside on September 18th, 1944. But the location was always a puzzle until we realized, I mean, it, it probably was 35th Fighter Group because of timing, they, they were the first group to have them. Um, and they had them in late June of 44. They then transferred their war-weary P-47s to the 348th Fighter Group right at the time where Margot's dad was assigned to start a fourth squadron, which is really unusual for a fighter group. That happened in July, and it happened about 150 miles from where the airplane was pushed aside. And so it's really the only squadron that makes sense. And so though, I mean, when you research this, you have to, you have to read the squadron histories of every squadron that had a P-47. But unfortunately, in the Pacific, supplies were short. Typewriter ribbons sometimes made the most important page that would really give you the answer completely Ill illegible. So what makes sense is it was used as a trainer for the 460th at the time they got rid of it. And if that was the case, then it's likely that uh, Bill Dunham probably flew it at one point or another. And it was at the time when this was pushed aside was actually before he got the third body by about a month. Yeah. And he got 16 kills, is that right? 16 victories, okay. uh, 15 in P-47s. Good. And then I'm sure um, his daughters will tell the story better, but he went back to the States for a brief period and got married. Bonnie was his fiance, Bonnie Harris, and then his P-51 was Mrs. Bonnie. Yeah, I was going to say, the first Bonnie, he was just, and I'll, I'll address this to the daughters, Margo and Shelley. At first, Bonnie was a, a fiance, is that right? Um, and, and he still named the airplane Bonnie, but then, hey, came back after marrying Bonnie, and uh, the next airplane was named Miss, Mrs. Bonnie? Is that Mrs. Right? Bonnie. Okay. And yeah, and I'll open it up now to, to, to Shelley Margo and, and just say, hey, um, oh, go, yeah. go ahead, Bill. Well, I've got one question. Was she anxious about that, when that plane's name was going to change from Bonnie to Mrs. Bonnie? Was there any question as to whether that was ever going to happen? <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Remember, remember to hold up your mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, it, it's, it, it's got to be an honor for you to see an airplane with your, uh, with your mom's name on it. And, uh, and yeah, tell us a little bit about your dad. Uh, you went on to a distinguished career, retired as a Brigadier General, as I remember. Um, you two are both brats, and so you moved around uh, a lot. Um, and, uh, and yeah, what, tell us a little bit about your dad. Well, he, first of all, thank you. I mean, this is amazing, just absolutely amazing. Um, he, he was just such a great guy. I mean, a great dad. He, he just made you feel good. He made you feel proud of yourself. He, um, he was so much fun. Uh, I remember drive-in movies. When we were younger, we'd all four sit in the front seat with pillows and blankets and uh, miniature golf. We, we played miniature golf as a family. Every, every move we'd make, we'd have to find the miniature golf course. And um, bowling, we, he taught us to bowl. We bowled 
bowled as a family. I remember when I was in junior high, we bowl, we were living in England. I, we'd bowl for 25 cents a game at the base <laughs> bowling alley. So um, just it's hard to you know compress it all in just a, a few things about Dad because he was he was really really something. Um, I'll what? tell you a few a few personal things. I mean, he and Mom were a great example of a married couple and. Fun things that I remember are um, she decorated a pair of underwear, put little bows and ribbons and hearts on them, and and would tuck them into his suitcase every time he went TDY. So, so he could always expect to find those in there. <laughs> yeah. And um, they they sent the same Christmas card, not sent, but gave the same Christmas card back and forth to each other for for, I don't know, 40 years, uh -huh. and I still have that. And each year they'd write a little something, so there's a little history each year of where we were, what was happening, and um, just fun traditions like that that were a good example for Shelley and I. Well, the one, the one story about uh, the, the, the one shoot-down that he had, um, and Chuck can, can back me up on this one, but, uh, you know, the fact that, yeah, he, he shot down the airplane and, and watched the pilot bail out, and then what? I guess he, uh, he he flew over, watched him land in the uh, in the water, and, and you can film it was, the rest. It, it's kind of interesting. Um, it happened to be December seventh, nineteen forty four. So it's three years since Pearl Harbor to the day. And uh, he shot down four airplanes that day. Yeah. And he saw, as as the um, introduction said, he saw the pilot go down, and he had witnessed his friend and commander. Um, Neil Kirby get shot down, and it, it was by that time it had been a year before it was believed that he was shot in his parachute too, or, or else in the tr hanging in the tree in his parachute. So he really had mo kind of motivation to <coughs> to shoot, and um, the restored the Japanese had been documented to do that in some cases, um, but he stopped, and I think that's the important thing. And then he saw the guy floating in the ocean, far away from, you know, any Japanese help. And uh, I don't know what motivated him exactly, but he made a low pass, which wasn't a real safe thing to do in a combat zone with an enemy aircraft around, and tossed out his Mae West. And that's kind of the end of the story. We don't know really what happened afterwards, but... Yeah. That gives you an indication of what kind of guy he was, though. Exactly. I mean, you know, a, a guy of integrity, of caring, and, you know, yeah, it's wartime, but... You know, uh, and, yeah. And, and as the the movie showed, I uh, we'd much rather he be remembered for that act of mercy than, you know, being a triple ace. And Understand. I'm sure that's what he'd rather be remembered for, that kind of um, compassion and integrity. Did he ever talk about that experience with you? Yeah. Yeah. So he did talk about it, and he to me, he, oh. He said um, that pilot probably had a little girl waiting for him as well, and, and a wife, and that was important. He was an incredibly compassionate man, and he um, he honored his all of his troops. He he didn't. He was a great leader, and he didn't feel. I had the stigma of the general's daughter, you know. That I had to. I was profiled. I had to live that down every time. We moved, but he, he was my dad, you know, he, my friends were welcome, and it, it didn't take long for them just to, to feel like, you know, oh, he's just, he's a dad, huh. and um, he loved to fly, he just loved to fly, and I always begged him, oh, couldn't you just put me in the cockpit, I'm real small, they won't know I'm there, <laughs> but of course they couldn't do that, but he, um, he also had a philosophy that when he was trying to um, introduce something new to his men or a new idea or something maybe wasn't working real well, he said, this is, this is, pay attention to this shell because this is a good philosophy of leadership. First, you suggest, you, you ask for their buy-in to maybe change something. And if, if it's not accepted and, and realized, then you try it again. 
and sometimes do it a third time. And if that doesn't work, then you have to order. You have to order the men to do it. But you always try the other first, you know. And he had a great sense of humor. We had a dachshund, a little dachshund that he adored. And um, they would play hide and seek every time he'd come home from work. First thing they did. And um, she would always, she was just a little miniature dachshund. She could always find him because she could smell him. Well, one day he got the idea to lie down in the tub. So here's this general in full uniform, <laughs> hat included, hiding from this, this dog. <laughs> and and he, he took him the longest time to find him because, you know, and then I think he made some noise noise because he felt sorry for the dog. So, <laughs> so, so the yeah, so then he climbed in the bathtub <laughs> and they're having this reunion, you know. So that, of course, that's the first place the dog checked, but he didn't hide there again. He just was a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, I'm so proud to be here to represent him. And um, I thank you all for being here. Yeah. yeah. One, 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 under indicator, one other indicator was, you said there was one award that he cherished more than anything else. And, uh, and I can understand that, and I'll tell my story after you tell your story. But. Yeah, he, um, when uh, he was getting ready to um, come back, we were going to come back to the States from England. Uh, the in, uh, something that was really honoring him was a, a going away party that the NCOs, all the NCOs in England got together and threw for him, which wasn't protocol. And that, that meant so much to him. And, and they gave him an honorary chief warrant officer award. And he, he said, this is one of my most special, special honors that I've ever received. So uh, he was a colonel then, a colonel being on, uh, awarded an honorary warrant yeah. officer. Chief. was yep. Yeah, I, I understand very well. When I retired, um, I was uh, well. I was obviously a flyer for a long time, and then ended up in maintenance. Got to know all the crew chiefs, all the maintainers very well, um, and uh, and worked my way up. And uh, something I cherish more than anything else right now is the chief plaque that they gave me. They gave me a, a chief bust, is what it is. And you know, chief master sergeant. It's the E9. It's the highest rank in the enlisted corps, and it's a beautiful uh, uh, bust of a uh, Indian chief with a very nice plaque on the bottom of it. And I know exactly where he's coming from. So uh, that, that gives you an indication of who this guy was also. So thanks so much for being here. I'll say that right now and, and allowing us uh, guys like this to honor your, uh, your, your dad. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, Absolutely. Uh, it, yeah. it's spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. How to grow delicious tomatoes. Step one, feed them while watering with miracle Grow liquid feed. That's it. Miracle Grow. All you need to know to grow. I want to talk a little bit about the restoration. There's two guys over there, Eric and Eric, um, who had a lot to do with it. And uh, hey, give me the highs, the lows. I it was eight years or so. Is that about right? Uh, how many how many years did it take? Well, like Bruce said, uh, we had the airplane at our shop for for <coughs> uh, several years. <laughs> um, we worked hard on it since we finished the restoration of Lopes Hope, a P fifty one C model. We restored uh, after that point. Um, we uh, worked hard on the P-47, and um, it's, uh, it's a huge, massive project. It's, it's not a P-51, we can tell you that much. Um, lots of parts. There's over 40,000 parts uh, in the P-47. That doesn't include the engine, the propeller, any of the instruments and things like that. Um, and we have an amazing team at Air Corps. Um, and uh, uh, lots of parts, of course, were fabricated for the restoration, but many parts were, were reused um, from the original airplane. That's what happens when you run late. 
you can see some of the, the team up on the screen there, and, and we've added several cents, and some, some people uh, um, just have joined the team recently and got to experience the finish, and some of them been through the whole project, and it's, it's really a mo monumental task restoring an airplane. Every, every rivet in the airplane, every piece has been disassembled, and, and um, uh, it's, it's just amazing and exciting to see the airplane fly again for the first time. And, and uh, help tell the story. And we, we all know when we fly the airplanes and bring them to places like this, uh, we really get to, to tell more and hear more of the stories. So that's what it's all about. I understand there's some signatures on it also. Um, and can you talk to it or should Chuck talk yeah, to it? Yeah, maybe that? Chuck can mention some of the, the signatures, um, the details. Through actually the same author that, that helped me connect with um, Margot, I connected with a general who was at the time 99 do it Searles, and he had been with the 460th. He had, not immediately, but he ended up commanding the squadron about a month after Bill Dunham left the 460th squadron. So I talked to him for several hours on, on you know, he was uh, magnanimous enough to take my call. And I said, you know, it, uh, I think Eric suggested. <laughs> I think Eric suggested that maybe he'd sign the access door. And so I asked him if he was willing, and we shipped it to him, and he signed it. Uh, then we met, contacted uh, another P-47 pilot that was still with us from Minnesota, and he signed it too. And then Huey Lang signed a different access panel, and there is a pilot step that comes from a P-47 that uh, was shot down in Italy, and we helped um, Hans Ronka find, it was his uncle, right? Um, and they excavated that airplane, and that pilot handle is part of this one. So there's four people that, are, that you know, it honors kind of besides Bill Dunham. Wow. Hans is here today, isn't he? Huh? Yes, Hans, Hans here? is here someplace. Yeah. There he is. There you, he can, is. Okay. you can ask, Wonderful. you can ask, Hans' questions at the end of the show. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Let's talk about the airplane performance. And we've got, well, we've got an expert over there and an expert over here. And I'll just say, yeah, Bernie yeah. just goes like that. <laughs> I'll talk to you first, Bernie. Um, what do you think about, uh, you went through engine testing with it. You did your first flights with it. Um, good, bad, ugly, you know, any, any big problems? Uh, it flies expected, uh, good performance, et cetera. It was way more perfect than we would have ever expected. I've flown other P-47s, and I, I told this story a few times. Propeller, engine, this airplane's original. It's got a 50-spline propeller with the right nose case. A lot of the other airplanes have been modified, so they take a late model nose case because you can't find some of the 50-spline propeller parts. They're just, there's none out there. Eric and his team sourced the Curtis Electric, um, but the guys want to run ham standards or for whatever reason. So they take a late model engine and bolt it on an early model engine. A couple things are different. The propeller's not, was not designed, that blade wasn't designed for the airplane. It might not be the right length, but the big thing is, is it doesn't turn as fast. Later airplanes, you turn the propeller slower, turn the, R the engine RPM up, you get more brake horsepower, but it's slower to accelerate. So during the test flight, first flight, we briefed it all up. I'm going to get on the runway, hold 30 inches. Warren was behind me in a Mustang. Him and Ben came down. I said, tell me when to release the brakes. I'll run the power up to 45, and it's going to go down the runway, and uh, it'll lumber off the ground at about 100, 110, and I'll put the gear up, which is really slow. They're really big cylinders. So it's a lot of hydraulic fluid moving, and they just, a Mustang goes, we're all used to seeing whack, and it's done. This thing, it takes some time, and the whole time you're trying to accelerate, that's a lot of drag. So I briefed this whole thing up, and I totally lied, because everything I said, none of it happened. I ran it to 30 inches. So these two things happened. I ran it to 30 inches. He said go. I went to 45, and it went, and I got the gear coming up, and I started a turn, and I, I mean, I told him we we're going to be 500 feet, 
you know, a quarter mile from the airport. We're going to drag this thing back around, and it's going to take two circles to get to 3,000 feet. I turned around and looked for him. I'm like, hey, are you going to catch me and look at this thing and make sure it's not leaking? I mean, and he said, I had Mito power on that thing. I couldn't catch you. And it just, up it went. So having all the original stuff helps. Yeah. It yeah. really does. How about landing? Uh, you know, you've, you've, you've landed a variety of these warbirds. Easy, hard, compared to, say, T6, P51. Uh, in, in between, is it, is it pretty docile? It, yes, it's, it's a docile airplane. It's got a really wide gear. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing is it's heavy. Yeah. And you're landing really fast compared to what you are in a Mustang or a T6. And, you know, the heavier they get, the faster you have to land them. But it, it's just physics. So getting used to that. Um, but handling characteristics on the ground are really, really nice. And, I, I, and maybe somebody can correct me, but I think this is the only Air Corps airplane to have a locking tail wheel, is that, to my knowledge, I don't think any other of the, the Air Force-ish airplanes had locking tail wheels. So you, you lock it and it's stuck going straight. It's real wide, it's long. So it's, it's really stable on the ground. Okay. I'm interested in talking to our other pilot now too. How about, you know, what's your impression, Jerry, of, of, of flying that airplane? Was it easy, was it hard? Um, did you uh, really enjoy it? Uh, you, you had, I know, 60-some missions uh, in combat with the thing. I'm sure you had a lot more training, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you think of, uh, of flying the airplane? You know, when you just graduated from flying school and they check you out at a P-40 in order to let you know how fast an airplane can really go, and then they put you in a P-47, it's a different world. But first, I think I might want to tell you how I got into the Air Force. I was 15 years old. I was living on Long Island. And a new newspaper came out. And they decided that in order to let the newspaper, which is Newsday, be successful, they assigned certain sections of the county to people to get subscriptions. So in a little area where I was located, I got the most subscriptions and the winner was a prize. And the prize was a flight from Mitchell Field, Long Island, over New York City. Well, here we are. I'm flying over New York City, and I made a decision. From now on, I am going to be a pilot. All right. <laughs> right. Now I'll go on. I'll go on. I'm 18 years old, and I decided I joined the Air Force because World War I is now in its first year. And I went down to the Naval Air Force Recruiting Agency because I could think of nothing more exciting than trying to land a plane on a boat that is bobbling up and down in the ocean. <laughs> well, I went to the Navy recruiter gave them all of my information, and after about 15 minutes of discussion, he said, I'm sorry, but we can't take you. I was heartbroken. So I went across the street to the Army Air Force. <laughs> At that time, it wasn't the Air Force, it was the Army uh, Service, whatever it Army was. Army Air Corps, that's right. Army Air Corps, right. And I went down, and they interviewed me, and after the interview, the guy said, OK, now go on to the medical supply uh, uh, doctor and uh, let him examine you. So I went into his office. He examined me, and he said, I'm terribly sorry, but we can't take you. I was so disappointed. I said, why? He said, when you were a kid, 
Evidently, you had your ears pierced several times, and you could never take eye altitude flying. Just at that time, a telephone rang, and he had to leave the office. <laughs> so I stood up, and I looked on his desk, and I saw the sheet of paper that had to be passed on to the next doctor. I took a pen and scribbled something where his name was supposed to be. I took it to the next doctor, <laughs> and that's how I got into the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll tell you about one of my experiences with a P-47. We were stationed in Pocatello, Idaho, and Pocatello, Idaho is rimmed by lava beds. Well, I took off on this baby, and I had two 500-pound bombs on the wings, and as I'm taking off and I get to be about 100, 100, miles an hour, and I realized I'm never going to make it. So I pull the wheels as fast as I can, dump my bombs, and before I know it, BAM! The plane hits the liver field. All of this time, I'm holding the nose up, thinking I'm going to make a nice, easy belly landing. I hit the ground so hard that the engine separated from the fuselage and traveled another 50 yards in front of me. And the only thing I could think of was, there's got to be a fire because all of that fuel is sitting under me. <laughs> I jumped out of the airplane, looked aside, and the only thing I got out of that was a concussion. But two days later, I was flying again. So my experience with that baby was that it could take anything. <laughs> <laughs> then there was a, you want to hear a couple of war stories? One yes, war story. We'll give you yeah, one yeah. war story, then we're going to do a walk around with Bernie. Okay, one more war story. Okay. Put your hands on a knee. Fold your thumb under your palm and make believe that those are the four 50 caliber machine guns that are sitting in the wing. Okay. We're out flying. We're doing a strafing job, and we're coming off at about 130 miles an hour. And for some reason, I look left, and there is a whole line of tracer bullets coming up to me. And tracer bullets, of course, are those things where you can see every bullet that's fired, and it's fired from a machine gun on the ground. This tracer line comes up and it starts approaching my number four 50 caliber machine gun casing. And about four inches away from the wing edge, it stops. Do you ever hear the story of the whole nine yards? <laughs> <laughs> well, when a machine gun armament is set up, the band is nine yards longer, and those nine yards are filled with whatever ammunition is used. Two inches before hitting the leading edge of my plane, it ran out of nine yards of firing, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> now, there were other things that happened to me, and one of the things, one of the reasons was my crew chief, after I told him the story about this escapade, he named my plane Mr. Lucky. <laughs> Believe it or not, I never saw a German airplane. 
The only thing we did was strafing and bombing, and in all the time I was in service flying these things, the plane never got hit with anything. So when they call me Mr. Lucky, all of my life, I'm known as Mr. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, yeah. we, we could listen to those stories for a long time. Yeah, I think, right? yeah. But I'm going to ask Bernie to do How just a quick you... walk around here and, uh, and, and talk a little bit about uh, the airplane, the, 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 the hardware, so to speak. So, Bernie, you got it. Well, we've already talked about the propeller. One of the cool things about this particular propeller is it's hollow. So they're steel hollow blades. That's an external cuff. The intake houses a whole bunch of stuff. You've got air going all the way back to the turbocharger, around the turbocharger to cool it, through an intercooler that cools the air after the turbocharger compresses it, comes back up, goes into the engine, which is a Pratt & Whitney 2800. It has a blower in it as well. So it's got two mm -hmm. blowers. Some of the Pratt & Whitney engines had a shifting capability. So you'd turn the blower slower down low. When you get to high altitude, you'd shift it, go to the granny high gear, and it would turn faster to compress more air. They, when they designed this airplane, just put a secondary blower back there run off the exhaust. So you've also got two ducts for the oil coolers, which come out here. What was the horsepower? Probably 2,300, something like that? What's a 59W? 20, 23, 24? It's okay. Wet. Uh, all right. Yeah. So 2,300 horsepower. Yeah. Like so one of the things about this engine as well, and, and one of the reasons they were able to do what they did with it, with the blower, was it has a gigantic like 50... How big is the water tank? So 15, 20 gallons of what we call ADI, it's anti-detonation and yeah. injection. And what that is, is it's water and alcohol that they spray right into the intake that cools the charge. If the, if the air going into the engine's too hot, it'll detonate. You only get a couple of those and then the pistons start flying out and it makes metal and all kinds of bad stuff happens. So they had a button on the throttle that when they were going to really high boost, they turn that on and it inject water right in there and it cool it off. Well, then you had the air going through the intercooler, which an intercooler does the same thing, but it's taking air going through a radiator looking device to cool it. Yeah. And the air coming out of the compressor cools it. So yeah. it's it's a it's an air to air deal. Um, here most people think this is where the exhaust comes out because in most airplanes that is where the exhaust comes out. That's not where all of the exhaust comes out of this airplane. This actually moves and it's a wastegate, so it'll close and port all the exhaust back to the turbo to make it spin faster to compress more. So when you're at high altitude, you take that boost lever and it actually closes this off. But there's always exhaust going back there, so that turbo is always turning. And it's, well, one of the cool things about a P47 is it's got two RPM gauges. One's in thousands, so when it's pointing to 10, it's 10,000 RPM. The other one's in hundreds. So the other one's engine speed. This, the other one is that's in thousands. Is it's actually got a deal on there to give you the RPM, and you can overspeed it. You can under, you know, the, you have to set it, and that's basically you got another little lever over here, like a mini throttle. So that was what was very unique about their design philosophy on that. The struts on this thing are pretty cool. They're two chambers, so as it sits here, there's 300 pounds of air on this side, but when the gear goes up, it has to collapse again to get in this hole. So there's a bar here that pushes a lever all inside the strut, and it pushes on a Schrader valve, and that air in here now transfers up here, and it equalizes it. So as the gear goes up, this thing gets shorter again, goes in here. However, if that fails, and the gear pops back with full pressure, you're gonna belly land the airplane. It won't come. It won't come out of the well. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we have the four machine guns that he spoke of, and apparently, it stopped like right there, his whole nine yards. <laughs> um, 
it they did have the ability to carry tanks this we didn't put any of that stuff in this airplane you know they could carry a 500 pound bomb they could uh, center drop tank for more fuel this airplane's pretty unique where it has what we call a christmas tree tank so behind the bulletproof armor there's an actual another tank that look, resembles a christmas tree that's why they call it that and they they'd stuff fuel in there too so as he was talking about you know you're you're sitting on all this fuel well, this one you if you're kind of surrounded by all the fuel and you're talking about you know uh, the load how much i mean could you carry say two 500 pound bombs i mean it was more a strafer than anything else but it still dropped bombs and how many you know would you yeah they would put one on each wing okay and then or you know one underneath okay. i don't know that they ever carried any bombs underneath i know they had tanks right you right. did they have rockets too Okay, so yep. they, they, they yeah, so it had a belly tank. They could sh put, hang rockets on the wings, bombs, bomb in the center. Okay. Uh, ailerons are really cool. This was something that I find fascinating because I like airplanes and I fly little aerobatic airplanes, but the aileron design, when it goes down, the air strikes it here. And I thought, like, they did that in the 80s. They thought that was a new thing. This was like 30-whatever. They already had the freeze aileron. So it's, and, and one of the cool things about this airplane is when you're flying it, it's it's pretty light on the controls, but the further you go, the lighter it gets. You get to the last part of the throw here, and I think you could just let go of it and it, it just keep on rolling because it's it's got that deal. It's like a spade. Mm -hmm. So um, big giant flaps. It's heavy. It's as they say, it's the heaviest air, airplane that they flew. So it's got big barn door flaps. Pretty cool design. They actually go out and then down which increases the wing area. So it, they, it was ahead of its time by a lot. I mean, it was designed real early and used quite a bit. Bernie, what kind of speed over the fence, typically? Uh, typically, you're going to shoot 120 down final and then come over the fence at 115, 110. Mm -hmm. um, this is the intercooler door, so you close this. If you don't need to cool the air, this is just cooling air for the in intercooler, providing the air back to the engine. You'll see an oil spot. The turbo has its own oil supply, which is in behind the rear seat. There's a tank. It's got its own pump. So when you start it, it starts pumping and it's returning oil through it. Completely separate system. So you have to check two different oil systems on the airplane, which is pretty unique. All of this, the shroud, protects the turbo and then all the other exhaust that's not coming out of the two little ports up front is coming out of here and if you could see here i don't know if you can get that camera up there but there's a big ring with just a bunch of little veins and that's the that's the turbine wheel that's turning the the turbo uh and then the rest of it's just big old giant airplane um i it, it the one of the things about this particular airplane and we spoke about it when we were talking about Thunderbird, uh, the having the high deck, the turtle deck, uh, puts the air back together coming off of the the uh, canopy, and that's a huge amount of drag. It's there's a gigantic low pressure from that air going over the top of the uh, the canopy, so having this high back puts that back together, makes it more efficient, makes it faster. However, you got all these bars and stuff in your way to be able to see, so you can see why they went to the bubble the bubble style canopy on all the fighters to to just give them the ability to be able to see the enemy. Jerry, did you fly both? You flew both? Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. I flew this thing in World War II and I was recalled for the Korean War and that's when I flew the bubble. Okay. Uh, and did, what you have a, did you have a preference? Yeah. Didn't make much difference as long as it got up and down. <laughs> <laughs> all right um thank you for that and i will now say questions um and and i'll open the questions up um for everybody here so we've got you know if you've got owner questions you got airplane uh, performance questions you got world war ii questions you got anything you want and we've got some microphones out there and i see all kinds of hands going up so bruce you got one right there go ahead how come there's so many more p51s and 
than these aircraft now? I bet Bruce could answer that question. That, well, that's a really good question, and I don't think I have a, a, a perfect answer to it, but I think that uh, uh, it just wasn't seen as as as, as valuable a plane as, as the Mustang, and so it, it got it got trashed along with uh, a lot of the other ones. I mean, you remember seeing the pictures of P-40s just stacked up like cordwood with the engines off up on their noses and stuff. But um, Connie Boland shared a, a wonderful story with us this morning about uh, uh, from a gentleman that had been present uh, uh, right after the war when they were destroying the planes um, uh, in the European theater and that they were it particularly uh, destroying them with dynamite. And, they, and this guy said they'd put a stick of dynamite in each plane and just blow it up. And... Um, but with the, uh, you know, as a testament for, to the sturdiness of, the, of these beasts, uh, they would put five sticks of dynamite in. And whereas the ones that they'd put one stick in, they'd just blow up. She, the, the guy said, with the jug, they put five sticks of dynamite in, and it would just go. <laughs> so, you know, you hear all the stories about how, tough and sturdy these things were you know coming back just shot all the heck or even the one with the guy that lost a wing and still brought it in i thought that was actually the best testament i'd ever heard as to as to how built these were anyway but i i, I don't have a good story for it. maybe you maybe you chuck being the historian would know why there's well, so few of, of these left they're expensive to operate yeah. and uh mustangs were taken over by a lot of foreign air forces and yeah. maintained and flew for a long time. And there's a type certificate for a Mustang that's a little easier to yeah. register than a P-47. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fame of the Mustang. It it, yeah. it finished the war. Everybody puts the war on its shoulders. And it was what every little kid at the time yeah. saw flying over. It was it was our, my generation's F-16. It was a single-seat fighter. It yeah. was pointing in the front, pointing in the back. And I think there's there was they were still active even after the war ended. So there's just a bunch of them there. Yeah. These things probably we're, we're all ended up in the scrapper by the time it, yeah. they were surplus and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. All right, next. Go ahead. Does anybody know what happened to the Japanese pilot who got thrown the Mae West? We don't. No. Sorry. That would make a great story. All right, we got a question over here on the right. I would love to know I where. I got a question on the. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I got a question on the uh, on the the uh, Razorback model itself. Republic made the Razorback, and also it was licensed built by Curtis, the P forty seven G. Right. How many of the Republic built are still in existence, and is there any fundamental difference between the the Deed model Razorback and the Curtis built G model? Uh, Chuck knows the answer. To this that. is the only well, flying. This is, and you have to be kind of specific because people always argue, "Oh, there's two other Razorbacks." There's two Razorbacks that are beautiful airplanes flying in California that were made by Curtis, and they're G models. And and Curtis kind of got behind the ball, and by the time they were producing, um, Republic had moved up a couple more marks and had, had more performance and so forth. So the, the G models never left the United States, and that's why those two exist. Um, this is the only Republic-built D model Razorback flying in the world. Okay, answers that question. Next, who, there we go, up, upper left. I have a question for Jerry. Jerry, where were you fighting in Europe? And where did you fly out of? In, uh, in Italy and the Balkans, uh, and uh, it was on the Adi Adriatic side. But it may be of interest to all of you that after the war, we all expected they were going to be sent home, but we weren't. We were sent to Linz, Austria, which was a now uh, uh, German airport that was given up after the war. And the reason we went to Linz, Austria, was that the people in government in the United States was sure 
that our fighter group was going to be the only area that would repel the Russians when the second, when the third war starts. Huh. Uh. And that's the history of the group. Wow. Interesting. Wow. All right, another question. Uh, there we go. What are you burning for fuel in this one now? 100 low lead. Do you have to derate the engine for that? Yeah, we don't run rate at what is rated takeoff power anymore. We it would be 51 inches dry. We use 45. What were they what were they using during the war? What was the octane? Uh 115 145. Okay. Okay. All right, another question. Thank you for the family. Thanks for the representing all the World War II veteran survivors, but I think it would be illustrative in this group, since it's we the people, how many survivors we have, like the two daughters here, whose fathers, not just the grandfathers, we could do that next, but fathers flew these in World War II. Yeah, I see. Oh. Yeah. There's one, oh, yep, one right there. Thank you. Another one over there. Here we go. We got more. That's pretty incredible. Thank you for that question. All right, another one. Go ahead. Question over here is, will we see this airplane fly this week? Yeah. Bernie? <laughs> yeah. 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 Bernie. Bernie, Bernie, you still here? Yeah. yeah. I was sleeping, sorry. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah, we're going to, we're, uh, we, we did have a little bit of a maintenance issue. We're going to test fly it uh, hopefully this afternoon during the air show. Okay, wonderful. And if you all get a chance, c come take a, a close walk around this airplane. I, uh, I, I happened to see it while the, uh, the EA judges were, were combing it the other day. And so I had the opportunity to, to look at it up close and personal. And it's, I'll compliment Air Corps, it is spectacular. I mean, the rivets, the, you name it, uh, everything is, is precise, I, I, I got to say. You and I'm going to, another outstanding I'm going to second that and plug Air Corps a little bit. I think this is the fourth, fifth, I don't know, a few airplanes now. Um, and particularly for me, this is like the fourth airplane I've test flown for me. They're being brand new or rebuilt, new engine, something coming out of other shops, major restoration stuff. And, uh, it's pretty much perfect. We, uh, had a really good test flight program. They all have hiccups, but that crew goes above and beyond to make sure that it's 100% and it works, it's, it's right before I get in it, before anybody gets in it. And uh, we had a little maintenance issue this week and uh, my hat's off to them. They spent almost all of yesterday not only getting it here judged, looked at, loaded, cleaned, everything, but then they had to spend all day yesterday trying to fix our hiccup. And it was literally like the 11th hour we got it out this morning and taxied over here. So just wanted to say thank you. And, and I'll just, I just, I'll, I'll just uh, say that I overheard a conversation with Eric Corps. And the one thing they said was there's, you know, there, there's a bunch of priorities in terms of getting these airplanes flying again. And you'll be glad to hear that the first priority is your butt, okay? So they want to make sure that butt gets down here again, and uh, and that's that's the way it should be. So I I, I thank Air Corps for that. At, My at wife the, appreciates that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, got a question up here. Uh, I just I just want to thank you again for bringing this plane back. My dad flew it to 404 Fighter Group in Europe, and I just sent two pictures of this to a gentleman named Floyd Blair who lives in Oca Ocala, Florida. I met him face to face this spring. He flew with my dad and I sent him the pictures and he said his airplane was never that clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we got a question over here on the right. How soon after restoration did you fly it and where will this be kept? Uh, we flew it 
like literally the day the paperwork was finished and every, I mean, it, a restoration isn't just getting all the parts together to make that. You still have to go to the FAA, still have to get registration. We, it's, if you want to talk about hurdles for an airplane, we kind of had a lot of them. Um, they won't register an airplane until it's an airplane. Well, we couldn't do any of the registration paperwork, so we got all done, and we went to registration. Well, there was this little thing called COVID, and nobody works anymore. They all are remote, so we had to go through the hurdles of that, and so it was just, it was done for a long time, but we were faced with paperwork issues, and then it has to get a stamp from a person that says it can fly, and it is airworthy. So we got that, and it was the same day we started the flight test, and I mean, it was, it just, everything clicked. We had to fly a certain amount of hours off of it before you could leave a general area. So we had to fly it around Bemidji for 10 hours and then we could take it to the paint shop and it was just, everything clicked. And we weren't doing this just once. We were doing this for both airplanes that were in Warbirds and Review today. Yeah. This cool aluminum, big giant beast and that shiny blue silver bullet over there. We uh, So they were doing it on and it was just back to back i mean we test fly this airplane go get that one they literally drove the airplane on a trailer from the shop a wing and a fuselage for thunderbird while i was test flying this i show up and here comes mark tisler in a pickup truck with a mustang behind him like it was not a big deal there's one thing i'd like to add about that is that this plane is uh, going to reside at the Dakota Territory oh. Air Museum up in Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> and I just want to say that uh, the Dakota Territory Air Museum is really, in the last number of years, has really stepped forward in a big way in uh, hosting all of our planes and, and having a, a, an incredible collection of vintage airplanes. And under the direction of Warren Peach and his crew, um, it's a real, even though it's up in Minot, um, it's a well worth the visit. It's an incredible place and they, they have uh, done a phenomenal job in hosting all of these warbirds. And it's and not uh, just warbirds. There's every, yeah, there's everything huge from yeah. preteen airplanes to obviously this brand new thing will be there. Yeah. But it's a it's a museum well worth going to uh, if you like airplanes. There's but a you little call, bit of everything. But you should call ahead if there's any particular plane you want to see because it may not be there because uh, we have a commitment to flying these and sharing them with people. These are not these are not hangar hangar queens. Yeah, this thankfully thing Bruce fly. allows us to keep them going, yeah. and and they build the airplanes with the intent on them flying. Yeah. They're not, they're not just going to get pushed out and run and then push back inside. Yeah. All right, we got a, a little guy. Oh, uh, get the big guy. I thought I saw the little guy first. I was just wondering if you could comment upon the elliptical wing, what it did for it. the elliptical wing. It's pretty. <laughs> Well, Spitfire had one too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. prettier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, but yeah, I, I can't speak to that. Yeah, I don't. I I'm sure somebody out here could explain the physics behind it. Um, I just go like this. It could be square. It could be round. I. Yeah. Sorry. No, no good answer. Now we got the little guy over there. Go ahead. How long ago did you finish this project? Two months. <laughs> About a month and a half ago, yeah. it flew for the first time. Okay. Okay. Outstanding. And we're, we're glad you did finish it and glad that you were here. All right. Yeah, these and poor guys are going to need a vacation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. One more. Good afternoon. I don't have a question so much as a comment. I had the opportunity to, to pick up Jerry, and he jumped into the Jeep as though he was a young, spry man. And we had the opportunity to get him in the aircraft, and he's not 99. I swear he's 20. He got up in that cockpit without uh, missing a beat. Yeah. You didn't leave the keys in the airplane, did you? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it's, I'm, <laughs> I'm worried that, yeah, he'd, he'd probably crank that thing up. Yeah. Well, all right, any more? Oh, one more at the top.
my father hated flying the 47 because he said the turbo lag was so bad. And I wonder if you could adjust, uh, you know, any comment on that. Well, the way they flew them, so there's a whole bunch of levers over here. A normal airplane has a throttle, a prop, and a mixture. This thing has a blower lever, supercharger, the turbo in the back, the throttle, the prop, and the mixture. And there's actually a way through some linkage on the actual levers that they would lock them all together, and it was automagic. You just ran the throttle, and the propeller went up with it, came back with it, the turbo came up, went back. Well, it's an oil-controlled butterfly valve that's got to do this. And I'm sure there was some turbo lag when they were up really high because they, like these things, they go click, and it's instant power. <laughs> Uh, those things, you know, they just, they go click and the burner turns on and they have instant acceleration, but you had to build up power in this, so. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say thank you to everybody involved here. Bruce, I say thank you. Thank you. Margo, Shelley, Chuck, Bernie, the two Eric's. And, and most importantly, and I'd like to finish, first of all, veterans. I want to see how many, how many veterans we got in the crowd today. I do this on every performance. Please stand up if you're a veteran. Thank you for your service. And, and the last thank you I want to deliver to this gentleman right here and say, Jerry, thank you. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for being part of the uh, greatest generation. So with that, I'll say, well done, and I hope you can come back next year. Are, are they able to come down for questions? Yeah, if you want to come down for questions or whatever, come on down. Um, and, uh, and yeah, these guys will be here to answer specifics if you want. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons, 
The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.